advertising on juicy.com and this fee-for-service work that collectively made up 50% of our budget. And it wasn't just in this last year, it was actually pretty consistently every year except for the years where it made up 60%. Um, beyond that, we incubated and promoted, promoted you know, great art in mainstream genres. Uh, that was all authentically Jewish at its core. We never expected to appeal to all consumers, uh, and not even all Jews, and not even all young Jews. We understood that we had a very targeted audience, and we sought to engage them, not, not the obvious ones, again, not, not everyone in the room. The, the goal was mission not to turn a profit, even with all these revenue streams. Uh, and that said, you know, we're incredibly proud of the 18 artists we work with, 35 album releases, uh, and, and endless, countless events around the country. Uh, in the last three years, we were producing 200 events in 52 cities in four countries on an annual basis. Uh, you know, we, we 3,500 people at Celebrate Brooklyn and Prospect Park coming together to hear Israeli, Jewish, Palestinian, and Muslim performers in traditional movies for music and hip hop being written up in Newsweek and on NBC. Um, you know, there's a lot of work for us to be proud of. But by 2010, we had reframed the mission to forging vibrant connections to Judaism through music, media, and cultural events. So the vision and programming was always broader than just being about music. And by the end, we were operating a multi-platform nonprofit media company, connecting all kinds of young Jews to meaningful and relevant Jewish life and experiences. Ultimately, though, it was a really precarious mix uh, that, that made up our business model. And by the end, it really just began to fall apart. So I'm hoping that this story will enlighten your future funding endeavors and how you think about working both with independent organizations and also young leaders. Uh, our end is wrapped up entirely in our beginning, and our story is the story of our peer organizations, as well as the, the industries we worked in, uh, which are unique to those industries and not to the Jewish world. So I think like the, the sort of headline for me, which is a long one, you know, is that the resources required to maintain no less than five uh, individual mission-related revenue streams, along with fundraising and other operating costs, strain the limits of our budget, time, creativity, and focus. Uh, I, my main takeaway is that you shouldn't think this is simple. There's no one magic, there's a couple big bullets, but this is, there's no one thing that, that did us in. So every year, you know, we, we earned half our budget, we met our impact, benchmarks that, that as we had set them internally. It seemed like every five minutes, some third party evaluator was studying our work and coming out with great positive results that we were happy to capitalize on. Uh, and we continuously collected our own feedback through surveys and, and focus groups, you know, listening to our participants to think about both how we could get better at what we did, but also to make sure that we were making the intended impact. The recession clearly had an effect on us like it has on pretty much everyone. Label revenues began to fall, uh, as did event sponsorships. You know, our fee-for-service work was very strong, but it was trending downward, not, not up. And you know, new projects like Juicy had great revenue potential, and we began to build those significantly. Um, but they weren't going to be enough to, to float us entirely. It's important to understand that there were tectonic shifts in the music industry. Right? At JDub's inception, you know, online file sharing and music piracy was just beginning to happen. Uh, YouTube did not exist. In fact, when we wanted to see that first Matisseau video, we had to do it through backwater channels because there was no way to put a video online um, without costing a ton of money on your server and getting it out legally and all these things. Um, MySpace didn't exist. iTunes was a year old, right? Um, in many ways, we got into the music industry at the worst possible moment and really at the end of an era and rode that wave uh, up, until, up until the end when it crested. Um, the, the last piece of that to understand is also that you know, music production um, had a huge barrier to entry. It, it cost $20,000, $50,000 to make a record. Whereas today, any kid in his bedroom can make an album, and it will sound pretty decent, and then they can sell it on iTunes. So there are 115,000 albums released every year, and 5% of them sell more than 1,000 copies. Right? So Jada was far ahead of that 5%, which is also pretty impressive. Uh, just in terms of like you know playing that numbers game, but just to give you a sense of like how much competition there is for <laughs> space on someone's iPod, for getting them to pay for any kind of music. Um, in many ways, it was a losing battle from day one, and we got in it because we saw um, a compelling way to reach lots and lots of people, and it really mattered to us personally. So all of that is still only part of the story. Um, you know, when I began looking at what would have been this next fiscal year, what is technically still this current fiscal year, uh, but you know, about a year ago, what I saw was a 30% hole in my budget, uh, and I didn't know how to fill it. So let me just walk you through like the, the literal steps as they happened. 
Uh, so first, about a year ago, we were turned down for a series of grants. Uh, this, in and of itself, was strange for us. Uh, we did not we did not necessarily go after every grant possible. We did our research, we did our cultivation, and we got something like nine out of ten grants that we applied for. Uh, so being turned down for three or four in a row was very concerning to us, um, and understandable for all kinds of reasons, but but concerning. Uh, individual giving had plateaued, so it made up about 10% of our budget. I used to think that was not good, um, but I've actually talked to a number of leaders of similarly sized and shaped organizations, and I've learned that that's pretty average. Um, so it was at a good place, and yes, maybe it could have been larger. It certainly would have required more than one full-time development staff, which I could not afford, um, but it was clearly not going to move above 11 12%. Uh, as I said, our fee-for-service work was profitable, but it wasn't growing organically. It was the one area we worked where we didn't have se uh, uh, separate staff, program staff. We really we pulled from everyone's expertise and time. Um, and while we were doing work, creating events, working on strategy, marketing, uh, communications, it wasn't a logical source of donations, and we didn't have the capital available to us to build it out as a business, even though there was clearly room for that kind of work. Uh, raising local uh, grants was not uh, the worst thing in the world. We, were, we had just secured a number of new local grants, but general operating dollars were almost impossible to come by. So Natan, which funded us consistently for seven or eight years, uh, was one of our only, and in some years only, funder giving us general operating support. Um, and even that I had to apply for every year. And for very understandable reasons, that was clearly going to run out or be minimized significantly. Then we have higher costs than we'd ever had before. We had set out always to create a very professional organization. It was important to me, um, as much as we could, to set a new bar within the Jewish world for what it meant to work in the Jewish world. What that meant was I pay people livable wages, or at least somewhat livable wages. <laughs> and that includes myself. Um, in 2009, right, right, smack in the middle of the recession, as a lot of this change internally was going on, we also had major staff turnover, which was important for a lot of reasons. Um, but it didn't happen, and we grew our staff. So I brought in a whole new cadre of of staff at what, what is clearly not the most opportune moment um, and didn't necessarily have all the time or resources to fully train them before I had to throw them in running to everything that needed to happen. Um, and again, ultimately, five program areas, a $1.1 million budget, nine staff people. We had a lot of work to do, and it wasn't as if you know five staff could do the same amount of work of nine, and certainly one was not going to make up the work of nine. And uh, maybe one of our big take away some challenges here, uh, the development culture in the Jewish world does not allow for shrinking, it only allows for growth. Right? So there's no way I could say, things, for whatever reason, I need to close these programs now, we're just going to do X and Y. Oh, but last year you did X, Y, and Z. There was no way that was ever going to be deemed acceptable. Uh, it was going to become a, a bigger hurdle in fundraising. Um, and so it was clear that unless I could do everything and more with less, that alone was going to be a huge challenge. I modeled out something like 12 scenarios. Changes in financing, changes in programming. I mean, if you can name it, I, I believe that, that we modeled it out. Um, and everything still gave us a very, very large gap, uh, in large part because it was unclear where those new uh, uh, grants were going to come from. Just because we could think of a new way to work didn't mean new money would magically appear for it. Brought all this to the board. The board asked for a third party opinion. We hired a set of consultants. Um, who came back with, um, uh, they did a great analysis, and their main suggestion was to focus on Juicy uh, as a great online platform and portal, and our fee-for-service work. So my, my main challenge is that I really saw all of our work as very interconnected. It was a delicate house of cards, um, and you know everything connected either to, you know, had value for the brand, for our fundraising, for our mission, for our bottom line, or all of the above. Um, and to take these two in particular and focus on them and to jettison what had been our core business, our core brand, uh, and core to the passion and drive of my staff uh, seemed totally untenable. A consulting arm of a nonprofit that helps others achieve a shared mission made a lot of sense to me, but a consulting business did not need to be a nonprofit as a standalone enterprise. Um, and I didn't have a staff that came in to be consultants, and that included myself. Like, we weren't in this to be consultants. We were happy to help others and happy to be able to earn uh, while doing that. Um, but it didn't make sense to me as a nonprofit. And Juicy, while great and exciting and new, uh, was not the thing that we were best at. So for it to be the only thing we did, it didn't make sense for us as, a, as an organization. Uh, 
talking us through with the board, we really did not come up with any other actionable solutions. Um, I did suggest one dramatic restructuring, which included laying off my entire senior staff, including myself, handing it over to our amazing and wonderful, but very young, uh, junior employees. Um, also, clearly, not, not a good idea. So there's a, there's, there's a lot to talk about just there, about a leadership vacuum, uh, about no concrete plan to exit strategy for myself or others. But fundamentally, the biggest challenge there, which I know uh, we'll get into later, was also that it was not going to be acceptable to our funders or the, the, the community of stakeholders um, to say in four months or six, whatever it's going to be, like, we're out. And it isn't because the cult of personality that existed regardless of uh, our extreme attempts to separate me from Jada um, had not worked, and and that was just it was it was I, would, I think it's safe to say unimaginable to the board certainly in this condensed time frame that we would need to to do it in um, and hard for me to imagine as well. So finally, right, modest staff reductions weren't going to do it, uh, and we were going to run out of money. Um, and so rather than just like hit a wall and have a, carry a ton of debt and really have no way to to even meet our obligations. Um, you know, we, we made a different decision, which was to call it a day at a moment where we could still be in control of a number of the outcomes. That includes uh, severance to our employees, but it also includes uh, saving as much as possible of our work. <clears throat> so while a lot of it is still not uh, totally complete uh, or public, you know, much of our legacy lives on. So what we're losing, um, very sadly, is the work we did to develop <coughs> artists and to help those artists develop unique Jewish voices and to do it in a cost-efficient way and particularly with music and live cultural events. No one is taking that on. No one I know is taking it on. It is the most expensive work. Um, but Juicy is now, has a home at Tablet Magazine, another amazing online property which we helped build over two years with an amazing staff uh, and a real understanding of what an online Jewish property needs to be. Um, the label, all of our records will stay active. They're being sold as a catalog to a for-profit buyer uh, a great business partner of ours, and by selling it, um, we, we incentivize them to continue to push it out in the world. So while that doesn't mean new j music, uh, existing j music will be in the marketplace for hopefully ever, certainly the foreseeable future. Um, uh, an archive is taking all of our business papers, uh, and a museum is taking really everything we've ever created for to be utilized in, in a number of ways there. So there's a lot of legacy there. I knew I wouldn't get through. Okay, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go like two more minutes, uh, if that's okay. Of course. Uh, okay. So after ten years with visionary foundations, federations, and, and individuals who clearly understood the need to take risks and innovate if we really want our community to grow and survive, we looked around in this kind of I mean, really, it was before this moment of crisis, and this was the problem. The gap in general came from the fact that there was. Uh, you know, not a lack of interest or need, but a complete and total lack of infrastructure and capacity to support a successful, mature Jewish startup. Right? So if you think about for-profit funding structures, you have an inverted triangle, right? You have an idea, you raise a little bit of money here, right? And the idea is like, if your idea has legs or you, 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 know, you sell at least the concept, you get a larger investment. And then to get to scale and profitability, you're gonna get even more money. You have to, right? this is how it works in order to get to where you need to get to. In the Jewish world, we have a regular triangle. The most money is available to startups, right? And as you get more successful, there is less money available to you. It's understandable for all kinds of reasons, but I believe that's a factor right now. If you take, if you take independent or innovative, however you want to qualify it, independent organizations right now do not have access as a cadre to more money as they grow. They have access to less. Um, I think this is a huge problem. Uh, I, I hope it's obvious why that's a huge problem. I think there's this unstated trajectory uh, amongst many in the philanthropic community for Jewish startups. You get foundation funding to get to start, you build a board, you build an individual, individual donor base, and that individual donor base allows your foundation funders to exit. Uh, except no one does this, except for perhaps federations. Like, um, and federations, I mean, UJ Federation of New York, an amazing partner to JDEB for so, so long, as are a number of other federations. But understandably, some of those individuals, I, I needed to, if I was going to build 200 huge entertainment donors, I, I was leap years behind them, and I didn't want to be competing with an important support. Um, I don't think this, this trajectory makes sense. I think the notion of sustainability is a red herring. I think it means to most of us that someone else will fund it so I don't have to, even if I love it. No nonprofit is sustainable. 
right? It's, it's not possible. If a nonprofit generates 100% of its, of its budget from uh, its revenues, it's probably illegal. Uh, it certainly can't do it from untaxed revenues. Um, that, that's, that's clear. By definition, nonprofits require philanthropic support. I think this is obvious, I think we all know it, yeah. but it's like we're just pushing it off on someone else. Instead of perhaps needing to say like, this isn't a priority to me, or this needs to move on. I think there are all kinds of acceptable, reasonable answers, um, but not in my backyard is a problem. Um, so here's what sustainability is to a Jewish nonprofit. You do whatever it takes to survive. That means you don't pay yourself, you know, you don't have a work-life balance, you expect the same of your staff, um, and you just do it as long as you can. And then at some point, you grow up. If you want to lead a Jewish life, this is particularly problematic because you can't afford it. Um, that may not be the same for having a family, whatever it is. Um, but, you know, what you do to project sustainability itself is not sustainable. Um, and, and we never, I'll, I guess I'll end here to answer that, I don't take all of your time. We never set out to exist forever. We clearly, we do not see this as failure. What we see is 10 years of success with an untested business model, um, doing more or less what we believe needed to be done. And we, you know, we didn't feel like we ever had to compromise our work, our values, or our vision. Um, and as much as we could critique our structure and our fundraising strategy, um, it's not the point, and it's not, it's not really what's, what's at issue. We were in a dying business industry, and there was no philanthropic structure for further support. And those two things together, collectively, really kind of undid us. We, we just could not find, find an answer there. I'll just end by saying, I think that the questions we were asking, which are fundamentally about like, why be Jewish today? Like, what does it matter to some kid who doesn't have great Jewish literacy, who knows he's Jewish but doesn't know much else? Like, why should he be Jewish? Right? In our in our unique way, we gave one not necessarily an answer, but a spark. Right? Uh, for some people, it was an answer. For some people, it was a spark. But we got out there. The questions are still being asked. Other orgs are clearly dealing with this as well. Uh, I think the biggest challenge ahead of us is addressing some of these challenges that I'm raising now because you know, young leaders will continue to try to come up with answers and organizations will continue to exist or at least try to exist. But if we don't address some of these fundamental challenges, at least in this kind of a sector, that's where the, that's where the problems really are. So sorry to get into some of your time, no. but, uh, but thanks for listening. So I, I as you know, both sat on the, uh, on the board of, uh, of J-Dub and was, was part of it for quite a while, and, and it was one of my, my great passions in the nonprofit world. Um, and I was also a funder. Um, I was a personal fund, funder and, and donor for, for a number of years, predating my, my real involvement in the organization. And uh, my family foundation, which is a relatively small foundation, uh, was a pretty consistent funder of JW as well um, over the years. Um, so I, I, I wore a couple of hats. and. and try and weave those together a little bit. But seven years ago, a young college kid from Big Fork, Montana, told me about this great CD he had copied from a friend of his. Uh, Big Fork, population 1,400, uh, is a beautiful place to live. Um, but it's not exactly the throbbing heart of the organized Jewish community. Uh, as you would expect, this particular kid was not spending his summers at Jewish camp. Um, and he wasn't really connected to, to the Jewish community or Jewish life in any real way. And although he left Big Fork for college by the time uh, I had this conversation with him, by all outward appearances, his Jewish identity was about as easy to, uh, to find and identify as Jewish life on Main Street in Big Fork. Um, so you can imagine my surprise when he told me, his older cousin, uh, that the new music he was listening to uh, was Jewish and it was cool which were two adjectives that uh, I had never heard him put together, and I'll bet he had never heard himself put together as well. Um, he hadn't heard of J-Dub. Uh, the music was not going to get him to join a synagogue, and he wasn't hopping the next flight to Israel. Uh, but for the first time, he was connecting with Judaism in a way that felt <coughs> natural, it felt proud, and it was personally relevant to him in his daily life. Uh, it was, as Aaron said, the first time that I heard him speak, the kind of music you could play in the car with the windows rolled down as you pulled into a parking lot in a public school, even a parking lot in Big Fork, Montana, apparently. <laughs> and as a community of nonprofit leaders and, and donors, we've all spent a lot of time trying to measure success, speaking for myself as well. Um, you know, we've tried to tear a page from the for-profit world um, where impact is measured by returns, 
um, and other metrics. And we've tried to find the, the corresponding yardstick uh, for, for the nonprofit world. And in that context, I think it's very easy to see longevity, or at least continued existence, um, as one of those basic yardsticks uh, for whether or not an organization has succeeded. Longevity, however, is at best a very imperfect yardstick, and at worst, it's actually counterproductive. For most mission-oriented organizations, the goal should actually be the opposite, namely to put yourself out of business. Um, I think we can all dream of the day when uh, soup kitchens and, and homeless shelters get up, in the, or people who run soup kitchens and homeless shelters get up in the morning and have absolutely nothing to do. Uh, I don't think we're there yet. Uh, for JDUB, however, I think the answer was somewhere in the middle. Uh, JDUB was highly successful um, and had great impact, both in its core mission areas and also in, in forging space for Jewish innovation and inspiring other Jewish innovators uh, to, to follow their own paths in whatever uh, course or, or cause was important to them. And at the same time, both missions are, are far from complete. So I don't think this is just a, you know, the organization was very successful. I don't think you know, it was a point where we, we folded up and said, you know what, we've done everything, and uh, there's nothing more to do, so we're, we're done. And that really wasn't the, wasn't the story. Um, moreover, much of the, the impact of JDUP was extremely difficult to quantify or measure. Take the story of my cousin as, as one example. Uh, as an organization, we didn't even know that he uh, had listened to our music since he copied the CD. Uh, if we asked him about Jada, we would have gotten a completely blank stare. Um, but if it weren't for that music, and whoever handed him the CD and, and told him to copy it, his personal relationship with Judaism would have become even more distant. This posed a real challenge for us in our conversations with, with donors, particularly as the recession accelerated and core social <coughs> service needs uh, and, the, and the needs of organizations across the spectrum became even more acute. I wish that I had a perfect metric to offer you tonight, um, a way to decide how to balance the needs of exciting new Jewish innovation uh, and the core social service agency in, in our backyard. Even in a community as, as wealthy and as generous as, as ours is, and I realize that this room probably tonight is, is filled with some of the most generous donors around, dollars are limited. Uh, we make hard decisions every day. And I don't have a particularly satisfying answer to offer, except to suggest a portfolio approach. That we mix funding for high-risk innovation that speaks to new demographics, young and old, or develops new solutions to old challenges, with mezzanine support for organizations as they mature, and support for the mature organizations in our community that continue to have a massive and outsized impact. But I want to spend a minute on that middle category, the adolescent organizations, because that's where JDUB floundered. When Jews turn 13, we say, congratulations, you're an adult. My, my son's only seven months old, so forgive me if I get the, the metaphor a bit wrong, but 13-year-olds are definitely not ready to go out into the world all by themselves and, and face those challenges. To the contrary, it's frankly an extraordinarily stressful time of growth and challenge. And from my perspective on the, on the JDUB board, over the, especially over the last uh, two or three years, it felt a little bit like reliving middle school with all of the, the challenges and, and trying to find our way. Uh, the external world was challenging and our needs were growing at the same time as, as Aaron just went through. Our budget was increasing each year. And even with those increased budgets, we were really, you know, Aaron, Aaron undersold this, but we were really severely underpaying our staff, and, and we were really borrowing from them uh, financially. We were asking more and more from, of them and, and not paying them uh, as they were due. You know, our, our senior staff weren't 22-year-olds anymore, um, you know, who could, uh, who could live a student's existence. They were adults with their own families trying to live in a ridiculously expensive city, and, you know, particularly if you want to, uh, to send your kids to day schools and things like that. It's not easy to do on, on the kind of salaries that we were able to, to afford. Uh, and I think that's one area that we need to think about as we, uh, as we fund not just organizations, but innovators who we want to be the future of the, of the Jewish nonprofit community, that we need to make this sustainable. Um, 
at the same time, funding was becoming more and more challenging. We weren't the newest kid on the block. Um, we weren't the beneficiary of true startup funding, but we weren't an established organization with a strong, robust annual donor base that, that would come in on a, on a predictable schedule. Um, as a community, we need to figure out this issue of how do we support organizations as they grow uh, through those awkward middle school years. At the same time, it's not easy. It's not an easy question for donors. It's not an easy question for, for the community writ large. Um, the organizations, these middle school organizations, their budgets are becoming larger. And at the same time, the need for mentoring and board leadership uh, from people like those of you in this room is even greater uh, as, as those challenges grow. Um, you know, the perspective uh, and, and the knowledge is, is even more, greater demand. But without the innovation and, and supporting these organizations as they grow uh, into more established organizations, we risk losing some of them, some of the organizations that have a real potential and a real connection and relevance to key demographics. I'm not positing that all startup organizations should grow and, uh, and continue to be funded, but I think we need to think about, uh, for those that are successful and that are having impact, how do we, how do we continue to foster that? At the same time, I want to say that there are some very positive things we can learn uh, from JDub over the last few years. Uh, the partnership that we formed with Nextbook and Tablet is, is an interesting and I think an important model for us to look at. Um, through that partnership, the two organizations shared physical space, they shared ideas, they shared expertise in reaching key demographics. Um, and similarly for some of the, uh, the relationships that JDub fostered with, with other organizations. I think that that kind of partnership and, and symbiotic relationship is something that we should continue to, uh, to pursue. Um, and frankly, I'm particularly excited that, that at least one of JDub's uh, important programs, Juicy, is going to continue to live on and that Tablet is, um, is becoming the, the publisher of, uh, of Juicy going forward. I just want to close. I've spent a lot of time dwelling on, on what JDub's story says about the state of Jewish innovation writ large. And I think you know, there have been a lot of articles and a lot of talk about what do we take out of this. And I think the decision to close certainly raises issues, right? The need for ongoing financial support, um, the personal leadership that, uh, that these organizations need from, uh, from experienced uh, lay leadership in the nonprofit world. Um, but frankly, you know, even with all of the questions that it raises, it's hard not to be excited about the ongoing potential of the, frankly, hundreds of new and innovative Jewish organizations in the US and around the world, and the individual innovators themselves, the individual people who are starting uh, and leading these organizations. They're unbelievably dedicated to finding new ways of addressing these challenges uh, and to, to having a direct impact. I truly believe that organizations such as JDUB will have an ongoing impact, both in achieving their mission and in creating space for future innovation and attracting new leadership and, and excitement to the field. And so I, uh, I hope and I believe that even though uh, JDUB as an organization won't exist, uh, the impact on people like my cousin who listened to that music for the first time, uh, and innovators who will come after JDUB and see it as a model will, will continue to uh, to bear fruit. Thank you guys. Um, there's, I think we could spend the rest of the night and maybe a couple more days teasing out all of these different things. I want to try to, I want to ask just two questions um, that really strike me as a funder um, about what you said. So the first really is about this issue of do we fund people or do we fund organizations? So in the time, you know, Natan focuses on funding organizations with budgets under $1.5 million, and we've focused on startups and emerging organizations. And so many times around the table, um, you hear people say, we're really betting on the jockey, right? But that obviously has a downside. We've seen it in the past few years as some of the organizations that we've funded for a long time have turned over their leadership. It's a very tricky um, thing to do. Um, not just from a funding perspective, obviously, or from, from a fundraising perspective, um, but it's it's not it's certainly not something that that is uh, that happens to us alone. I've heard it countless times, and as a and as a good thing, like we believe in people, we fund people. Somebody said it to me about why they give to Natan. I thought that was like nice, but then I, then my next thought was, well, what if I leave Natan? You know, what happens to your money? Um, 
And I want you, Erin, just to talk about that a little bit more. I mean, because it gets to these points of succession planning and, and what do you do when you're burned out? What do you do when you're too expensive for your own organization? What do you do when the work that the organization, that the work that would enable the organization to survive is not the work that you want to do? Or even what do you do, you really love music and now your job is like three stages removed, three steps removed from that and you're managing you know, nine people and raising all this money and that's not what you went into it for. I guess the way to, I don't know the way to ask the question, except to say like, I guess if you were to do it all over again, if you start an organization tomorrow, how would you build this kind of knowledge into your, into your plan? Hmm. Thanks for uh, So look, I mean, I, I, I do think this, I think it is very complicated on, on both sides. I guess I'll start at the end, the last piece, which is, um, you know, the issue of like, you know, uh, I mean, er, a long time ago already, like I realized like I was no longer a programmer. Like my job was much more fundraising than it was, you know, doing deals in the music business. And, and that, but that was okay for me. Like, so the piece where like, uh, as a leader and an innovator or whatever, like you have to give up certain things you like because there's more that needs to be done. I was totally okay with that because that to me was a mature decision about I'm gonna run this organization, there's a lot to do, my expertise is certain places, it's needed certain places. So that piece, I, I think there are a lot of, I know that there are a lot of current leaders who are struggling with that, but I didn't feel like I, and the first year was because my team allowed me to insert myself at certain times. You know, like they knew what I wanted and needed and, and vice versa. But partially, I really feel like I accepted that and I sort of, in many ways, I moved on. Um, but the, the, the issue of, and let's just call it the cult of personality, because that's what it is. So I think that it, it, the, it is instigated by some of like the startup funders, right? Uh, so I go back to like when I was in Joshua Venture, which uh, what, right, without Josh Venture, Jada would not exist. That's like important to say. It, it was an incredible experience, and I give it in, insane amounts of credit. And Aliza is one of our lead consultants for working with me through that and bickering so much. Um, but there was a moment in jo while we were while we were funded that it somehow came out that it wasn't about our projects; it was about us. After telling us explicitly in the application that it was about our organizations, we had great business plans and this and that, which was all what I mean. I appreciate hearing that you look like how our application was written. My first grant application had eleven editors, right? People who had the grant. My mom, right? <laughs> but no, because I figured if my mom could understand it and someone who had, you know, like it, it was very strategic the way we did that. We took it really seriously. Yeah. Um, but so, so that first time when we were told, after being told that it was about the orbit, it was about us, that was, we didn't know what to do with the information the first time we were here. Um, 2007, 2008 perhaps, at a JFN conference, a funder who is funding a position in my organization pulls me aside and says, we just want you to know, you know that if we're with you. So if you need to move our money around, you want to do something different, just come talk to us. It's, all, it's about you. And they were trying to be supportive and uh, nurturing and I wanted to cry. I was like, I had been, at that point, we had made internally a very conscious effort to decouple me from Jada. I stopped doing interviews with the press. I, we, 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 I mean, we had other people involved in pitching. We had, you know, other people going out as, as all kind, in all kinds of leadership roles explicitly to empower them and make room for their own leadership growth and to decouple it from me. There was the time that someone was introduced as me <laughs> when they went to receive an access check. Um, but, so, but so that experience, but that was bad. That was really bad when it was like, so what? The person we're funding, it's all about you. Like, that was hard. And more recently. Um, hard because it wasn't about the organization and what you yeah, did. It was just because about what, right, yeah, yeah, sorry. a woman who was introduced to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, hard, sorry. Hard, great, right, because here I was really, tr not because at that point I was like, I'm out in a year, but because like, this shouldn't, it's fun at first, but it's like, oh, lots of attention, that's nice. But I wasn't doing it for the attention, right? And so to make it, or to make it just about like my vision, my this, my that, like when I no longer felt that way, and certainly didn't want that, to hear that for all of that, what I thought was all this work put in to make that space, it was still about me. I mean, I began to realize that there was like no exit. But, um, and more recently, more recently though, I had a great long conversation with a current funder in processing all this. You said, like, if you now leave the Jewish world, like, basically, basically, you know, chava, like, what a loss to the Jewish world for all this investment that's been made in you. And it was really meant as a very nice thing. And 
I, it made me, I really got upset. Because you know what I heard in that was like, we've invested in you, we own you. Indentured servitude, you are with us for life. <laughs> And that would be okay, that would be okay if it was explicit what I signed up for. Right? And, and to pay that. Well, certainly if it pay, no, but I mean, this is, so this is where, like, I will, I'm going to, like, throw something down. I think that if uh, funding of certain innovation and independent organizations is actually about funding leadership, I think you're wasting your money. I think that it's time to be honest with yourselves and with us as leaders. Um, in part because we need to know it, and also you do, like, it's just inefficient. There are more efficient ways to build leadership. There's, you know, there are fellowship models. There's all kinds of models. The money would be better spent in those places if it really isn't about the organization. I think whatever the answer is is perfectly acceptable. Certainly, funders have every right to make their funding decisions however they want. I will, I'm never the guy to say like you should like I'm not going to tell you what to do with your money. But I I I, I hope you want to make strategic decisions, and I hope if you're willing to, you're doing that, you're willing to question your fundamental beliefs and the reasons behind your investments. Um, uh, so in, I, I think the point we've gotten to is dangerous. Ultimately, I, I think that making it so much about the leaders traps the leader and traps the organization. Like so, it's possible there are lots of organizations that shouldn't exist because people are just funding uh, a charismatic individual. And, and really, like communal dollars are being wasted, or, or, or vice versa. Um, so this is an area, clearly, I feel passionate about. I think it's really complicated. I did not want to leave. This is not to say I wanted to. You know, If anything, I thought my number two was the one to leave after he invested personally in business school. Um, and two years of business school, uh, he realized that he wanted nothing more than to stay put because this was the best job he was ever going to have because it coupled his personal Jewish passions, which only fit into the JDUB box. And that was actually true for many of my staff. 90% of them had not worked in a Jewish organization before, and only one of them has taken a job in a Jewish organization since. Right? Like, people like him, they, they were falling over themselves to stay put. But the moment we realized that salaries could not grow, or if anything, couldn't even exist, then it was like running, people were running for, you know, had to start running for the hills because you wanted all you want at the point at which real life takes over your, your stock. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> I have a different idea. <laughs> I definitely funded individuals. Um, usually, right, always, not explicitly. And, and the organization has to be compelling. <coughs> the organization has to mean something to me. Um, and I have to believe that there's impact. But I've seen a lot of organizations that have changed, that have evolved, that have uh, that have grown in different ways. And frankly, JDF's a perfect example. It was just a music company. It was just a music and event company when it started. By the time we ended, it was five different streams. It was juicy. It was music. It was events. It was fee for service. It was uh, such a wide spectrum. That doesn't happen without leadership. And so, I think. From my perspective, um, looking at the organization, especially at the startup phase, this is not necessarily for big established organizations, but at the startup phase, to understand the organization and understand the leadership, I think is very important to me. Um, I have definitely, you know, I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable balancing the two and saying, you know, I don't really know how compelling this organization is. I think it is, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm, I'm struck by this leader and I want to give them the runway to, to try and make this work. And if it doesn't work, frankly, I hope this great leadership stays in the community. I don't see it as indentured servitude. And if Aaron's next role is is outside the Jewish community, I will be a little sad, I admit. Um, but that's entirely his call, right? And I don't feel the least bit let down or, or, um, or sort of personally uh, uh, slighted by that. Um, so it's not indentured servitude. But funding leadership and funding leaders, I think, is is important, um, and I think it is it is something that's that's worth looking at and thinking about. And it doesn't necessarily have to come in the form of a fellowship. I actually think it can come in in funding uh, what their what their passion is. So I guess I see it a little bit differently. Certainly more calm. Sorry, certainly more calm than I do. Yeah, the one other thing that I wanted to ask about um, before we open it up is. Um, is this question of how you message the fact that you're in trouble, um, the fact that you're struggling, right? And you know, to think about um, from funders, like what conversations you are comfortable having with funders, how much you let the word get out that like we're looking at this major hole that might close, cause us to close, 
Um, and I'm thinking about it actually specifically from the point of, of the, the investment world, you know, that, that so much of um, the investment world, so much of the markets are based on confidence, right? Mm -hmm. um, and when one, you know, investor starts running for the hills, everybody runs for the hills, right? Mm -hmm. And then people come in and buy it because it's really cheap. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but how I think also just about how I, as a funder, talk so much to other funders and how much I rely on their opinions and, you know, what they think of organizations. And if you start talking to me and I'm tell you're telling me how much trouble you're, you know, you're having and I start talking to somebody else, like it, it potentially becomes a self-fulfilling um, prophecy, right? So I guess the question, again, I don't really know what the question is exactly, except, you know, how would you, how would you suggest to us that we kind of deal with this issue, right? If we either don't, like what, not, what ideally, what would the conversations be like between funders and organizations that would lead to people wanting to pitch in to help the organization rather than to say, oh, I gotta go, this is, you know, this guy's going Well, so I mean, I think everything about your characterization uh, of how it is in the for-profit world is true. Certainly, I believe it's true. Um, I definitely did not, I mean, some people asked her, why didn't you come back? No one, no one said, why didn't you come to us for support? People said, why do you think he didn't go to someone for support? Um, and the answer was because the hole was too big. And it was, right, so because there was no, no, it wasn't like there was a structure and, and capacity currently in the community to fund us, and they just weren't funding us, and we were in crisis. I, it was clear to me that like, the kind of grants we needed were not out there, and we had not yet found or cultivated the individuals who themselves were going to write the kind of checks that were going to solve us. And we didn't have a reframing of the model. It wasn't like I was like, I need this gap funding so that I can get to my new model, which is going to save like, our crisis again was not only about the lack of money. Um, so that was part of it for me. And I was I was sure that if I went out there with like, you know, I'm going to be $400,000 in the hole. You want, you know, you're going to help me out or am I going to close? Like, I was just going to freak people out. That said, we, again, like, I mean, I think there was a lot of our work that I thought of as like advocacy within the Jewish world. Like we. We certainly try to play the game differently. Um, so, you know, there are certain funders who have, you know, set grant types of grants, and you know, would say, you know, only ten percent can be for operating support. So, in those cases, we'd have to take those. But we realized that we could change that game, and so going to new funders, and this goes back six years, five years, I would sit down, whether it was a federation, an individual, whatever it was, and say, like, if you want this program work here, like, it can't be ten percent. Right? Like, I, I will go bankrupt giving it to you for 10% when I have no one to pay for it. So either pay 30%, which still won't cover it, but is much more reasonable. So like, we tried, even in, in the moments of success, to be clear about what it would, what it would take um, and how inadvertently taking money in the wrong ways would, would really sort of set us on that spiral. And it was actually very successful for a long time. And we were able to raise much more for operating in many ways than I know some of our peers and had been done before. Um, so I guess you know we, we always try to be open up until a point. There were probably two funders I spoke to in the midst of these things. You were one of them. Uh, but I definitely, I was sure that like if there was no way, I think that people give to success. I, Sharna Goldsecker taught me very early on um, you know, to find, to strike this balance when raising money of projecting incredible need but also incredible success. Mm -hmm. and, and we always tried to learn from that and, and, and strike that balance, right? You showed uh, past successes, conveyed in, in incredible need, presented a plan, and showed how they were gonna, you know, a funder would close that gap for you. Um, but in this case, uh, I just, I couldn't wrap my head around how I was going to convey success, the success part of this. And I think when there's only need and there's only crisis, um, I don't think people give. Uh, so, so that's my. I didn't see another way for us, and and I'm not sure there was another way in the again the very particular place we were. I think transparency is great and ideal and impractical, um, very often, uh, and that's and that's very challenging. But I do think I think we we struck we aim for as much transparency <coughs> as possible. And I think that what you said before about that it's not just about hey we're about to go off the cliff, but even like we can't even stay static year to year. Never mind, go down a little bit. Um, because people want growth. Right, and, and I, I think that's also, I mean, I have one lovely funder with us for many, many years, um, but I applied for a grant 
pre-recession. I was grant. I was the grant was made at the beginning of the recession, and before I signed the documents, I asked that we change. The, they also gave me half of what I asked for, and then I asked that we change the benchmarks because it was already clear to me that with half the money during a recession, what I had initially set out to do wasn't going to be anymore, and uh, the decision was take it or leave it. Uh, so we took it. Clearly, we had to, we needed to. Um, but it's just, I mean, the situations that we, get, that we sort of can get set up and were very, very tricky to, to maneuver. I, I agree. I don't think that there's a great answer to this. I, I think that um, going out and, and at a time of, uh, of weakness and, and saying, look, we're desperate, um, doesn't work. I mean, we were going through this and having some pretty intense conversations amongst a small group of board members uh, about a year ago. Um, really intense, you know, detailed conversations. It was the dozen different scenarios that Aaron mentioned. Um, and I remember at the, at the JFN conference last year, talking to a couple of the people who were in the room on a, tonight on a very quiet, uh, you know, basis because we were being very careful as to who knew and, um, and we were soliciting input and guidance, but um, we were trying to avoid that. And I, I will say, you know, there were a few uh, a few grants and things that came in even after we announced um, that we were shutting down, uh, and those were people who were very committed to the organization. And you know, for me, I, I personally, you know, my wife and I made a contribution that uh, uh, that came in shortly after we made the decision. And part of the explicit reason that that we did was we wanted to provide for um, for adequate severance for for the staff. Um, and I guess that goes a little bit, you know, if you feel like an indentured servant, you know, there's some of us who, um, if we're inadvertently causing that, at least, you know, think that uh, there's some commitment in the other direction. Um, but, you know, I absolutely understand people who, after you say we're shutting down, but we're looking for some money to, uh, to, to support that on an orderly basis, say, that's not our game. I mean, it's a little bit like a politician doing a retire the debt campaign. It's not exactly the most compelling uh, uh, pitch. I, I, I just have two clarifications. I don't feel like an indentured servant. I was just saying that in that setup, I might. Um, and I should also just clarify that that same funder who I had a challenging negotiation with is also one of the few to say, like, are you okay? Do you have what you need to shut down? To even ask the question. Not even about they were going to make the gift, right? But very few asked the question. Uh, and, and that was much appreciated. So like, I, I, I want to make sure we're, we're clear on my deep appreciation and the complexity of some of these uh, relationships. And, Every funder, except for one that I'm still negotiating with, um, completed their gift. I mean, we had, we had work that was completed but not paid for. We had some work that wasn't completed, and I asked those funders to make the gift anyway to help us close out. And all but one thus have, have, have done so, and I'm optimistic the last one will, uh, will, will come on board as well. Okay. Open it up.